Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's August 18th, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, Oregon's tracking of gun owners was bought by one man, Michael Bloomberg, who outspent the NRA 15 to 1, while The New Yorker magazine thinks there's too much free speech. And we look at how Planned Parenthood buys its government subsidies from senators. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. The Food Babe has been a guest on our show, and she has had another recent victory. And to tell us more about this, we have Leanne McAdoo. Leanne? Well, Starbucks has announced that they are going to be pulling the artificial coloring from their pumpkin spice latte jacari in all the white girls literally cannot even with this news. This is big time news. Uh, but basically, you know, Vani Hari, the food babe, she put out this big campaign last year and she was like, T when are you going to take the caramel coloring out of your pumpkin spice latte? So the Seattle based company announced that they're going to go ahead and do that. And they're also going to be using real pumpkin flavoring, real pumpkin instead of just the flavoring additive. Wow, you well. mean people want real food in their food? Yeah. Okay. No, and all, all you needed to do was just care a little bit and have enough of a, a, of a campaign out there. And so they're really responding. It's very effective. And so this comes on the heels of another victory uh, where a major beer brand actually is going to remove the caramel coloring from their beer as well. You know, beer is one of the only things that people have in their refrigerator that doesn't have to have a label to say what's actually in it. Um, and so that was one thing that she was able to draw attention to. Um, so uh, Heineken is actually going to be pulling caramel color. There's really no reason for it to be in our food and our beer. It's just for the look of it. And, um, you know, why is it a big issue? Caramel coloring has been known to cause cancer. And it's basically the uh, the process that that they that it goes through uh, during the manufacturing of giving it that caramel color. Mm -hmm. It produces a carcinogen, which, you know, obviously in, in lab rats and things, it's causing tumors. Right. So, and then this is being put in everything. So, but it's not just caramel coloring. We have, you know, yellow food dye, red food dye, blue food dye. These are things that have caused controversy over the decades. Mm -hmm. So it's always been controversial. Um, you know, the food babe has also gotten craft to dump artificial food dyes from their food as well. Uh, you know, what is the thing? Like, they think that children are not going to eat macaroni and cheese if it's not, like, fluorescent yellow, you know? So Maybe. It, well, it's so much cosmetics. A lot of things you're talking about, it's just for the cosmetic appeal, and I guess that's really what they're trying to cater to. Yeah, exactly, and that's what that that's one of the big issues. They say that Americans, they're not going to want to use toilet paper or or feminine products or even the uh, the coffee filters unless they're bleached. All of those things are naturally a little, you know, they're brown, mm -hmm. but they don't, you know, they think people aren't going to want it unless it's bleached and you're like dripping your coffee through these things. So of yes. course that's affecting your health. And obviously with artificial food dye, um, it's made in a lab. They, it requires a warning label. Okay. These things have been banned in other countries, but they're perfectly safe for Americans for whatever reason and for all your children. And uh, yellow five, yellow six can be contaminated with known carcinogens. Um, they, and a lot of uh, uh, parents are really concerned because they can cause an increase in hyperactivity. So let's just look at some of the potential dangers of artificial dyes. Okay. And, you know, you cannot get away from this. And this is why it's so big. It's not just craft cheese. But uh, we have it in candies, drinks, popsicles, pudding, yogurts, you know, pickles, meats. Um, you can all, it's in vitamins, cough syrup, shampoos, it, it, literally in everything. And it's all just because of the way things look. They want it to look a little bit different on the shelf. You know, mm -hmm. you want your red shampoo or your green shampoo or whatever. And all of that stuff is leaching into our skin. Um, even if we're not, you know, drinking it or ingesting it, it's still being it's soaking into your skin. Not to mention the BPA in the bottles. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, for decades, this has been a controversy. They've been using food dyes. It used to be sort of natural food dyes, but these also, too, could have arsenic um, and mercury, copper, things like that could leach into these natural dyes. So those aren't necessarily a safer alternative, but... Uh, Food companies have been kind of creating their own. Uh, just for an example, uh, a Halloween in 1950, uh, the government banned orange number one because many children became ill after consuming Halloween candy. 
um, in the 1970s, red number two had uh, was causing intestinal tumors in rats. So then it was banned. Yellow number one, two, three, and four are among others that have since been made illegal. And yellow number five is undergoing further testing because it has links to hi hyperactivity, anxiety, migraines, and cancer. So, and this is of course another color that has already been banned in a number of European countries. So it's still being used in all of our food. Other countries are banning it. Parents are really concerned saying that, you know, it's causing behavioral problems in children with ADHD. And of course we're seeing uh, exacerbated amount of children with ADHD. Hmm, I wonder if that could be because so many things have these uh, carcinogens in them. But then they point out how Conflicting results from studies among scientists explain why these are still approved here in the United States. Well, why is that? Why do we have conflicting results among scientists? You say, oh, well, it's, it's FDA approved, right? Well, the FDA has approved uh, BHT, for example, which causes lung tumors, okay? Lung tumors and inflammation, but it's, it's FB, FDA approved, so it should be- Well, that be shows you what the FDA seal of approval means. Right. If you can get uh, you know tumors from this stuff, it's not exactly the most credible agency out there. Right, and they just want to keep their handle on the food industry because th the, the FDA is sort of a huge front group for all of the food corporations that are out there that have a handle on everything that we consume, all of the products out there. I mean, you can see Coca-Cola and Pepsi and, and General Mills. I mean, they control everything that we consume. So, of course, they don't want you know, people to figure out that all they've got to do is plant some organic food in their garden at their house and food is free. I mean, they don't want us to know that. They've gotten us completely away from that entirely. Um, but another thing that a lot of people don't understand, there's sort of this assumption out there that food has to go through this really rigorous testing and safety process, but it doesn't. So when a company creates a new food additive, um, they can submit a petition with the FDA, but of course that can take several years, even decades. And so they're probably not gonna wanna go through that whole mm -hmm. petition process. So they can also uh, use a, a loophole to um, determine that something is GRAS, which stands for generally recognized as safe. And once the FDA decides that an ingredient is generally recognized as safe, they never have to get it tested again, never has to be approved. And basically the way that they can do this is that they can hire their own experts. And sometimes these experts can be their own employees. And <laughs> so they bypass that FDA petition process entirely. So the company informs the FDA only if they want to, right. because it's a completely voluntary process. So that's the when you see GRAS on a on you know something that you're eating, that's what it is generally recognized as safe. Which means most people don't fall over dead after taking it. Yeah, and it's like in within certain amounts, it's tolerable within certain amounts. Just don't consume more than one soda a day, which a lot of people drink more than one soda a absolutely. day. Absolutely, absolutely. And now they've come out and said, you know, it's a probable carcinogen. This caramel coloring. Or really everything that a lot of the foods out there that you're eating, um, if it's not you know non-GMO certified, it's going to have glyphosate, which has now just been determined to be a probable carcinogen. Um, but the other thing that's going on is that this campaign to get all of these GMOs out and to get food labeling and to pull the additives and the caramel coloring and things like that, it's been so effective. And the food babe, you know, she's just one woman who has a lot of followers who are very supportive when she puts out a petition. And now they don't even get to the petition point with her. They just say, oh my gosh, the food babe's on us. We're gonna take it out. You know, and that's just showing how effective this is so now they're going on this anti-campaign and they are hiring experts to infiltrate the media to now confuse you about food because once again, this is just a huge effort uh, for these corporations to hold on to their share of the food economy. So you can look at, um, there's the top 11 food and agricultural industry front groups. These, these companies are spending millions of dollars uh, and they have these very misleading names. So the names they have, you know, you're thinking the Center for Food Integrity, Center for Consumer Freedom, 
Global Harvest Initiative, Coalition for Safe and Affordable Food. So they have these names that you're thinking, wow, they're really looking out for my best interests. Uh, but these are just huge lobbyists for these food corporations. And, you know, Monsanto, Dow Chemical, Coca-Cola, Pfizer, Kraft Food, Tyson Foods, all of these companies that control everything that we consume. And so, of course, they're not out there looking for, for the consumer's best interest. They are looking out for these corporations. And so the issues they focus on are defending GMOs, the pesticide use and antibiotic use in livestock, promoting the safety and necessity of GMOs, uh, things like this. And of course, so the, what they're, the quotes that you're going to hear in the media are things like, U.S. meat production is safe and efficient, and it does not overuse antibiotics. And of course, now there was this massive hysteria just mm -hmm. a year or so ago because it's actually all the antibiotics that we're using in livestock is actually causing antibiotic resistant bacteria. And plus, I think it was a couple of years ago, they had some drought or something like that, and they were actually feeding the cows candy. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. so, I mean, it's not just yeah. that. It goes far beyond that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. And so this is, this is kind of the propaganda that they've got to push out. You know, organic is no better than conventional. It's not worth the money. You know, who cares if you're pumping your body full of all of these pesticides? Um, the one I love is that we need GMOs to feed the world. If you were really producing genetically modified foods to, to feed the world, then you would not genetically modify them so that the seeds could not regrow themselves. Mm -hmm. and that repopulate. You have to, yeah, repopulate. I mean, that just infuriates me, the, the lies that they tell. And then, of course, they, the organic foodies are elitist. You know, 100 years ago, all food was organic food. Right? It wasn't all pumped full oh, don't of Don't tell them that common sense, Leanne. Yeah. That we all used to eat organic food. Oh, we're, we're too trendy because we want to be healthy and we care about, you know, not having cancers and things. Who knows what it's going to be? But these are the same type of experts, the same type of mentality that we saw being pumped out with the tobacco industry many years ago, how they were pumping out this propaganda to, to tell you that it was perfectly safe, producing candy cigarettes for children. I mean, take a look at this old advertisement. Doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to Camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how Camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. Right, and so you can see how decades later we can see what a blatant lie that is, blatant propaganda, and that's the same thing that's happening now with our food and with genetically modified organisms. Coca-Cola was actually just in the news last week because they uh, were found to be funding scientists who are shifting the blame from obesity away from bad diets. So there's like this big campaign now against sugary drinks. And so they are backing these scientists who, you know, have to come out and admit that Coca-Cola is actually providing them financial and logistical support to do this science. And so this is the Global Energy Balance Network. They're basically coming out and saying it's not these sugary drinks, it's that people don't Get enough exercise. The half truth. Yeah, take a look at what this guy has to say. Most of the focus in the popular media and in the scientific press is, oh, they're eating too much, eating too much, eating too much, blaming fast food, uh, blaming sugary drinks, and so on. And there's really virtually no compelling evidence that that, in fact, is a cause. So as you can see, that guy is like the epitome of health. I mean, that guy just is really who I want to be giving me all of my health advice. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what it is. I mean, just blatant propaganda. And this is what we have to go against. But people say, oh, well, science says it's okay and it's FDA approved. Just blatant lies. Well, I mean, it's always <laughs> that argument, well, science says, science says. Back in the day, uh, science said cigarettes were perfectly healthy and there's nothing wrong with it. They had the Flintstone cartoons, and my doctor recommends I smoke a pack a day so I can get a deep voice, you know, yeah. and all this other stuff. And just think how science has changed the way that we look at everything. And Leanne, if you're done here, I think what we should probably leave our viewers with is just to talk about the impact. You know, we started this whole conversation talking about Vani Hari, the food babe. And even if food isn't your thing, whatever it is, politics, whatever, children's health, 
just see the impact that one person can have. She goes right. to these food corporations, she goes to uh, Coca-Cola, she goes to Subway, she gets them to remove uh, additives from their food just by going in and making her voice heard. Right, and just the support from, from everyone out there, just viewers like you, that's all it takes is for people to have this effort there. And bottom line, if it's good for you, you don't need science to back it up. There you go. All right, thank you, Leanne. Well, stay tuned. Coming up after this break, we'll have more special reports. You don't want to go anywhere. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. When we talk about lobbyists, one of the big groups you hear about is the NRA. The gun lobby is so big. The gun lobby is so powerful. They're bullying all these people to get their way. Well, I disagree with that, especially now that we have this article. And it details how Bloomberg outspends NRA 15 to 1 for Oregon background checks. And this is according to data released by the Oregon Government Ethics Commission this week. Every town for gun safety spent over 75, or excuse me, $750,000 to pass extended background checks by law. In opposition, the National Rifle Association paid about 48000 for the same time period. And these are the groups that were formerly known as, uh, what's it, Mayors Against Gun Violence and Moms Demand Action, something to those to that effect. And the Moms Demand Action was originally a million moms against gun violence or something like that. And the reason why this is very interesting to me, because you have these groups, as I said before, they said they're so big and powerful, they spend all this money, but Bloomberg's doing the same thing. And even though I disagree with Bloomberg and uh, a lot of his uh, constituents on this issue, you know, I can respect people going out there and marching and campaigning and putting their money where their mouth is to get their agenda across. So I can, you know, respect that even though I don't agree with it. But the fact of the matter is, you can look at the FBI's own statistics and see that you're much more likely to be stabbed to death than shot by a fully automatic rifle. And that's not my opinion. That is a fact that you can find on FBI.gov. And that's one of the big things that this group is pushing, or these type of groups are pushing. They want to ban fully automatic rifles that are used in a very small percentage of crimes, at least here in the United States of America. But even with this common sense approach to uh, telling them the fallacies of their logic, they'll hand you a flyer. It says, we want to ban assault weapons while telling you that we don't want to ban any guns. And you're saying it says right here on this flyer that you handed me that you want to ban assault weapons. We've shown you the clips down at the Alamo. And it's not just that, it's many places as well. And now it's getting to the point where people are starting to realize this bull more and more. Even if you're not a gun owner, you don't like guns, you don't want guns in your house or around your children, that's your business. But for people such as myself who say, hey, if somebody kicks in my door at three in the morning, I want to have a shotgun ready to defend myself. I think it is a very important issue. And we'll see how this develops as they go more and more in depth. Now, let's talk about a different topic. Talk about racism. There's a lot of that going on in the country, a lot of that in the news right now. And it's even overseas. And we see a Danish politician convicted of racism for offending Muslims. Now, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and say that he was talking about radical Islam, uh, people such as ISIS and Boko Haram. But the quote was, Muslims continue where Hitler stopped. The only the same treatment that Hitler got will change the situation. And this was by a former European parla Parliament member, Mogens Cameron. And after the tweet, uh, he was charged under the Criminal Code for Racism Clause 266B, Paragraph 1, which makes it a crime to offend a group of people who were threatened, insulted, or degraded on account of race, color, national, or ethnic origin, religion, or sexual orientation. Well, to me, it's pretty damn offensive to chop people's heads off and burn down Christian villages and do all the other crazy things that ISIS has done. Now, I definitely recognize there's a difference between Islam and radical Islam. Myself and Joe Biggs earlier this year went to the Stand with the Prophet rally in Garland, Texas. This is the one before the shooting. This was a, a month or so before that. And we talked to Muslims and they said, we condemn the actions of Boko Haram, of Charlie Hebdo, of ISIS. We don't agree with any of this stuff. That's them and this is us. And I definitely take them at their word. So it's not all Muslims are bad. It's like some people choose to do these things just like, and so one of the things one of the guys told us is like, ISIS does not represent mainstream Islam, just like the KKK does not represent mainstream Christianity. And talking about the Klan, we'll have a special report from the Alex Jones radio show earlier today coming up later in our program. Let's talk about some blood money. And this is talking about Planned Parenthood and how they have paid off many politicians. And it has the article, Kristen Burton Brown of Live Action, a pro-life news organization, did some digging and discovered that all but one of the senators who voted to block legislation that would have diverted funds to non-abortion health clinics have received cash from Planned Parenthood in the past. 
And there is a big long list, but I just highlighted a few names that you guys may find a bit interesting. Of course, we know Harry Reid, $800, according to this report. Dianne Feinstein, $10,000. Chucky Schumer from New York, nearly $21,000. And Barbara Boxer from California at a whopping $25,000. And these are the people who go out there and they say, we have to do this for the children, we have to do that for the children, but they have no problem funding an organization that's willing to kill the children in the womb. And as we're talking about the children, they're banning words. They're saying that you have to call the kids purple penguins and all, these, all this other nonsense. And now we have the biggest gay lobby in America urging schools to ban the words boy and girl. A new back-to-school guide published by the Human Rights Campaign designed to make classrooms gender-inclusive urges teachers to avoid using gender to divide and address students so as to prevent any transgender students from becoming upset. Now, all this gender inclusiveness, we've seen reports about young ladies going to the girl's bathroom and there's a dude in there pissing and they say, hold up, there's a guy in here using the toilet and then they charge the, the girls, they say, you guys being hate mongers or whatever the, uh, the vernacular was. So it's gone to complete insane levels of you can't have anything that's separate boys from the girls in a bathroom is a pretty good example of that and now we're going to end tonight before we go into more special reports with a story i think is somewhat uplifting we've seen the actions of isis and similar groups going around killing innocent people and now we have the quote they rape us we kill them and now we have the quote they rape us we kill them yazidi singer forms all female fighting unit to take revenge on isis for forcing their sisters into sl sexual slavery and beheading their brothers and it details how they have about 123 recruits aged between 17 and 30. And even the youngest recruit who is 17 is not worried about being captured in the battle. Which, you know, this is why you have a Second Amendment. So if you do have roving gangs or terrorists in your neighborhood, you can take matters into your own hands and defend yourself. Because, yeah, all the rhetoric in the world, all the gun-free zone signs in the world didn't stop these people from being raped, captured, uh, beheaded, and all that. So we need to keep that alive in our country as far as the Second Amendment. Now, we're going out to break with this. This is a special report detailing how robots can impact minimum wage in the near future. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. The campaign for $15 minimum wage is gaining in strength with several U.S. cities moving to double the pay rate for low-income workers. Unfortunately, the very people fighting for 15 are at the most risk of losing their jobs to automation. The Washington Post made a startling front-page admission raising the minimum wage to $15 could speed the arrival of robot-powered restaurants, killing millions of jobs in the industry. That includes 5.4 million servers and cooks and many of the nation's 3.3 million cashiers, especially at fast food restaurants. About 30 percent of the restaurant industry's costs come from salaries, so burger flipping robots become that much more cost competitive if the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour is doubled. And many chains are already at work looking for ingenious ways to take humans out of the picture. Today's robotic workforce is much smaller, much cheaper, and capable of doing a variety of jobs. Compared to the cost of an average annual salary for just about any worker, including minimum wage employees, the robotic workers' one-time cost and near perfection in their job execution is a very appealing option to many employers. A 2014 Robotics Business Review article, How Robots Will Shape Future Employment and Law, estimates that by 2025, half of the jobs in the United States will be performed by brilliant machines and intelligent systems. Here are just some of the jobs that will be lost to automation. Pharmacists, lawyers and paralegals, astronauts, store clerks, cashiers, drivers, soldiers, babysitters, rescuers, sports writers and other reporters, marketers, customer service, and factory workers. So the question is, if these jobs are taken over by robots, what will we do? It's a difficult problem, and I, I was at a meeting where there were five Nobel Prize winning economists, um, and all they wanted to talk about was this question. Uh, what's the future of employment and the structure of the economy when most uh, of what we call work now is being done by robots? Um, 
And unfortunately, even though that was what they really cared about, they had no suggestions. You know, you go to Japan and there's no one taking your order. You go to a vending machine and you order it. And obviously the Japanese economy has dealt with that. Automation poses a threat to millions of workers, but it could create opportunities for a few. And if the future looks more Star Trek than Blade Runner, robots taking over our jobs and producing more than enough of everything that everyone needs might mean the whole paradigm of exchanging labor for pay starts to break down. What if the need for work disappears altogether? They say we have too much in this country. We have too many large cars. We have too many reality TV shows. And I wouldn't so much disagree on the reality TV shows, but now they're saying we have too much free speech. And the New Yorker has come out and said that we should dismiss free speech and these free speech extremists and compared speech nuts to gun nuts. So this is what we talk about when we say people are coming for your rights because they try to be reasonable or so they claim to be reasonable. Just give up your Second Amendment right. You don't need that. The cops are going to come and save you if anything happens. I can tell you that's not always the case. And that's not bashing the police. I'm just saying they can't be every place at once. They're very reactive. And to go beyond that, now it's not just give up your Second Amendment right. Now give up your First Amendment right. We can't have all these people speaking and saying the things that are upon their minds. And yes, do people say things that are inappropriate? You know, in my personal opinion, yes. But what I think is inappropriate may not be inappropriate to you and vice versa. So when we talk about this situation of censorship, we can't go wild because as you guys recall, we've shown you the articles about purple penguins. Don't call them boys or girls, call them purple penguins so everybody can be included and have a great time and nobody has to feel left out. Also the articles, let's ban the words mother and father, husband and wife. And even if Johnny has two mommies, you can still call them mother and mother. I don't understand how the actual phrase is offensive. But now it's to a point where they're talking about one of the most popular movies in the United States right now, straight out of Compton, which is a huge battle for free speech. They're attacking the rappers, calling Ice Cube misogynistic and all this. And I'm not vouching for the lyrics of these guys, NWA or anybody else. Do they have a free speech right to say those things? Yes, they do. Do I agree with everything they say? No, I do not. But now they're saying there's too much free speech. You can't have this. You can't have these guys talking about the police in a negative light. And to anybody who says that, I've seen the police do very negative things. And it's like, it's, it's the pen is mightier than a sword. This is a perfect example of this. These uh, police officers, some police officers, not all police officers, chose to harass various people in low-income neighborhoods like Compton back in the time. And then it gets to the point you have a group like NWA where Ice Cube can come out there and write these lyrics that are hugely impactful to the population at large. Once again, I'm not vouching for everything he says, but it's a perfect example. The pen is mightier than the sword. So now as we go more into this, we have a movie review of Straight Out of Compton that myself and Kid Daniel shot last week detailing all this and so much more. And stay tuned after this break for more special reports. Kid Daniel's here with Jakari Jackson, who's behind the camera. We just got out of the Alamo Draft House and we just saw the latest movie Straight Out of Compton about the legendary hip hop group NWA. Now, uh, overall, I definitely recommend the movie. It was way better than I thought it would be. You know how a lot of movies are kind of hyped up beforehand? This was no exception, but this movie almost lived up to the hype. And even if you're not a big fan of hip hop, I definitely still recommend it just so you could see a glimpse of popular culture as well as the history of the late 80s and early 90s at the time. Now, there was one scene in the movie that I thought was very interesting was the uh, musicians were at a press conference after they were arrested in Detroit after uh, a riot. And I think it was Ice Cube who said that their art, meaning their music, reflected their reality. Now, the reality at the time was, and it's still true today, is that the CIA controls the international drug trade. And they do that to mainly so they can uh, fund their black op operations, you know, the kind of off of book things, you know, where they overthrow governments and who knows what else they do. And in order and for them to uh, create this demand for drugs, back in the 80s, they used these various intermediaries, you know, such as music executives, to uh, push hip hop to the forefront above rock and roll and to glamorize the drug trade and drugs to ensure that there was a demand of, for drugs from the American inner youth to ensure that the CIA would still keep getting money off the drugs they were importing through the country. And it was back in 1996 that a journalist by the name of Gary Webb, who was writing for the San Jose Mercury News, 
He revealed that a former drug kingpin in the 80s, Freeway Rick Ross, one of his cocaine connections was actually tied to the CIA, and that created a huge scandal. Now, Rick Ross was on the Alex Jones Show back in November, and he said this. I'm letting you know right now that the establishment is using hip-hop to prime these kids for a life that's going to send them to prison, just like they did with me. See, when I was coming up, that was Superfly, Tequila Sunrise, Scarface, all these movies to make you think that you could start with nothing and then you could have the whole world at the palm of your hand. Only that there was no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It was a set of handcuffs and shackles. And you want to know why the CIA symbol is behind me? Because they were the guys behind me when I was selling drugs. And now they're behind hip hop and rock and roll. This prison, hip hop connection, they're behind that too. If it was if it was good for them to sell drugs, then it, it should have been good for me to sell drugs. The money from the drugs went to buy guns for the country. Even if you don't read my book, warn your kids, let them know. But I advise you that this book is worth reading, definitely for your kids. Even if you don't read it, get it for your kids, get it for your loved ones. Let them see what the drug culture is all about. So to sum it all up, the drugs that you saw in the movie and the drug lifestyle and the decadence of the inner city, that was all created by the CIA to, to ensure that there was still a demand for drugs and to bolster the CIA's profits. Now, Jakari, what did you think about the movie? Thank you, Kit. Now, if I could take one quote away from this movie, it was when the guys were all together at a press conference and somebody brought the point that we have AK-47s from Russia, none of us have a passport. We have drugs coming in from South America, none of us have a passport. It reminded me of that line in Boys of the Hood where Lawrence Fishburne is talking about we don't have any planes, we don't have any ships, how does this cocaine get here? And it goes on to the point that Kit was bringing about, that even these guys rap about this stuff, they're not the ones who actually bring this stuff into the country. And there's another aspect, the free speech aspect that Ice Cube touches on in the movie, and I think he is still a vocal free speech proponent to this day, that these guys have the right to go out and say whatever they want to say and talking about their situations, their involvement with the police. Now, if there is a villain in this movie besides Easy es manager, uh, the police are definitely, definitely the villain. But these guys are talking about what they see. That was their experience growing up in Compton, that the police would harass them and do other types of things. That was their experience. I can tell you, people say, I'm anti-police. I'm not anti-police. I'm anti-police brutality. I'm anti-police tear gassing me and then lying to my face like I wasn't there when it happened. So I can definitely understand that aspect of it. And I don't want these guys to be silenced for that. But people always try to say, uh, try to put uh, blame on these guys. Eminem had a great quote. He said, next time you assault a dude, tell the judge it was my fault and I'll get sued. And that's kind of how I feel about these NWA guys or anybody in the entertainment industry for that matter. Yes, they put this stuff out there, but it's ultimately your, your decision if you go you know, rob a liquor store or whatever. So with that in mind, I can kind of relate to that because people say you're pushing this anti-police rhetoric. When I show a video of police uh, tear gassing people or shooting innocent bystanders with rubber bullets, that's not me being anti-police. That's me exposing the actions that happened that particular day. So with that being said, I think it's a good movie overall. Like Kit said, I think it's a much better movie than I thought it was going to be. So if you're interested in that period, that late 80s, early 90s period in Los Angeles, the things that are going on, the Rodney King riots and all that, it touches on that stuff as well. And it's also a good cautionary tale for people who are interested in the entertainment industry as a whole. You can see the trials and tribulations these guys went through, the bad uh, managers, uh, the life on the road, people, you know, every, half the people in the movie get, you know, uh, babies along the way or they get illnesses and all these other type of things and they have to deal with that. So I'd recommend it for that. So you can find more reports on Infowars.com and don't forget to subscribe to our new channel, Resistance News. Now stay tuned because after this break we'll have a special report, a clip from the Alex Jones Show. And if you guys haven't seen this, David Duke, who is a former Grand Cyclops uh, Decepticon, Sith Lord, I guess, in the KKK, came on and had a very singular worldview about a particular group. And one of our master editors, longtime editors here at the show, Rob Jacobson, jumped into the fight to challenge Duke on his ideology. Stay tuned. You do not want to miss this exchange. So he's been here 10 years. Rob Jacobson, 
And, of course, we get the orders from Tel Aviv. They go through him. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, Rob Jacobson helped make Endgame. He helped make so many of the big films that we produced. He's one of our great video editors. He studies the New World Order. He exposes it. And he wants to talk to David Duke. Now, I don't know if David Duke's scared to talk to a Jewish person. Uh, I'm being sarcastic. He may think he's going to grow vampire fangs or something. But, uh, Rob, I didn't even think of this. In fact, next time David Duke's on, we ought to get you in here in studio so you can talk to him and, you know, uh, make your own points. But but you've studied the Federal Reserve. And, and that's a point I didn't make earlier, that a lot of the people that founded the Federal Reserve, some were Jewish, some weren't. They ended up funding fascism, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And that's something David said earlier that, no, there's no connection to Nazis trying to take over America. No, I said fascist. The McCormick-Dickstein Committee exposed that. There was a major pro-Nazi movement here in the U.S. The Bushes were involved. And next time Duke comes on, we can debate that further. But but I need to go to these calls, too. But, Rob Jacobson, you wanted to talk to David Duke. Yeah, yeah, I was just curious. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I was just curious. Um, I, I heard all this uh, conversation during the radio show today. And, you know, uh, Mr. Duke seems to be pretty educated in a lot of uh, parts of the world. And you guys were uh, talking about bankers. So I was just curious if he could... Explain to me which one of these bankers is the Jew of maybe the uh, founders, maybe the guys of the Jekyll Island, you know. I'll just name them off, and as soon as the Jew is there, the hidden guy, you know, whatever. He could, he could just educate us, I feel. Is Nelson Aldrich Jewish, Mr. Uh, Duke? Duke? No. No. I don't think so. Okay. How about Abraham Pyatt Andrew? We want to name some of the Jewish names, or are you just going to name the no, Gentiles? No, I'm just curious, because you seem to think you know, that Jews are almost completely responsible for we everything know. that's wrong in the world. That I don't really... I think Rob's think point is, I think there's only one guy that's Jewish on the list. Rob there knows. is, there is one guy. Let me answer the question. Let me answer the question this way, okay? Okay. You've talked a lot about the most powerful banking family in the world historically has been the Rothschilds, and the, the six sons of the Rothschilds went to six different countries and led the banking institutions of those countries. In this country, the most powerful capitalist banker by far was Jacob Schiff. He literally financed the Russian Revolution and ultimately caused the death of tens of millions of Christians. The Federal Reserve for the last three decades has only had Jewish supremacists, Jewish extremists, as head of the Federal Reserve, who support all the major Jewish organizations which oppose all the principles that Alex Jones talks about yeah, here. Yeah, but Mr. Duke, this is not the origin of this place. You're you're <laughs> definitely cherry picking history here picking because to support your side of history. Let's go further. Let's talk about the original 1929 Big Six. Which one of them are Jewish? I mean, these are the guys that started. Let him ask the question. All right, listen. I think Jekyll Island was set up to try to get in as much of Gentile collaborators. There have always been Gentile collaborators. But you, there's no way to deny the fact that the international, the most powerful predator bank on planet Earth, who's practically picks the members of our F Federal Reserve, picks the members of our Treasury Department, is the biggest contributor for presidents of the United States, both Republicans and Democrats. The biggest single corporate contributor is Goldman Sachs. But this Mr. is recent history. But this Goldman is very Sachs recent. was more of a socialist movement. Yeah, well, this, is, this is within the last 25 uh, years or 35 years. Uh, this, doesn't, uh, this isn't like uh, deep-rooted stuff. This whole system was set up by the Rothschilds. This whole uh, you could say that. I mean, but you could also say that the Rockefellers contributed to that, and so did Andrew Mellon. Yeah, let me ask you this Carnegie's. question. What about the Rockefellers and the Nazis? Because the Rockefellers worked with the Rothschilds. In my experience, the Rothschilds helped start some stuff in Israel, but they just play both sides. I see the Rothschilds as really just uh, very uh, sociopathic. Rothschilds, by the way, bought off Winston Churchill. As a young boy, they used to they they financed his kit when he went to South Africa. The Rothschilds gave him a huge wedding present to his wife and kids. They they were developing uh, Churchill because he was an aristocratic Gentile, and they know to advance their program, they've got to have Gentiles involved. And Churchill drove Europe into a war, a horrific war that killed 54 million Americans, um, excuse me, Europeans, and also caused the you know the take over of half of Europe by communists, which at that time had a lot of Jews involved, and they also basically took over the West. This war was a catastrophe. So there are Gentile collaborators, but if the Jews don't run the insiders, the elite of the world, then why is it that Israel, Israel's a law right now, where it's against the law for a Jew to marry a non-Jew? 
If any American, any European, any Canadian proposed a law where it's against the law to marry a Jew or against the law to marry a well, non it's like an anchor baby deployment. thing. They say guest workers can't marry How someone to be able to stay there. We have wait. similar laws here for sham no. marriages. Well, but this, let me answer the question. If any country of the European world had tried to pass such a law, if that happened, you know that they would be demonized. They'd practically call for sanctions against a the country. They'd practically invade them uh, for that reason. But Israel can do it. So why is it that the only people allowed to preserve their heritage and push for their power over all of us? Sure, but let me throw this out there. I got <laughs> corrected on this because I saw a leftist publication reporting that years ago. And then I read deeper into it. They have sham marriages where people pay to get in as a guest worker. Then they marry somebody so they can stay in the country and get welfare. It's the same thing as anchor babies. And then the media spins that, that it's a race law. Israel is even using DNA to determine who their, who their immigrants are going to be. DNA. I mean, my God. Israel is a racist supremacist state. They have segregated schools, segregated developments, segregated housing. They've ethnically cleansed 600,000 Palestinians. They massacre them. They burn them. They kill whole neighborhoods. Right? Yeah, but that doesn't and prove there's the no fact. sanctions against Israel. So that that I mean, a, a lot of these groups, a lot really of these groups are are actually. Really you, we, we could talk about groups <laughs> from every single uh, uh, ethnic group of the world and have similar yeah, evidence. Why, what you're why, saying doesn't definitively prove, and you're also not including the place where a lot of these Jewish leaders intermingle with a lot of the Catholic and Protestant leaders <laughs> and all the other <laughs> leaders of the world. Right, well, let's stop right there. We got to go to calls, David. I promise. I'll have you back, and then would you like to debate Rob Jacobson next time you come back? Any time, because I can show. Then, then maybe that's the problem of why you're not talking more about the Jewish issue, because some of these Jews, they pretend to be on our, our side, but they won't recognize Jewish racism. They won't recognize I mean, the fact that every major Jewish... That's not fair, of what you're saying. Well, Rob is my what boss, you're saying, David. I'm, saying, I mean, I'm asking you, Mr. Duke, to broaden <laughs> your mind, because what I'm saying is I recognize everything you're saying, and I'm saying... Let's go a step beyond that and look at the true group that's behind this, and that's an intermingling of who you're saying as well as Catholic and Protestant and all world leaders who intermingle. Well, exactly. It's like the Masonic groups. secret societies have roots in Israel, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and of course there's a Jewish okay. element to it because so because because I mean your name's David, is, David. Wait, that's wait, wait, a Jewish wait, wait, wait. name. It's part of our culture. If the Masonics are behind it, then according to your reasoning, I'm not saying that Masonic specifically. I'm just saying. There are groups out there where these people intermingle, and we it's have all like Bohemian Grove, for example. Uh, these these men intermingle every single summer, and they discuss policy as well as creative ideas and scientific development every summer. And it yeah, there are some Jews that go there, but guess what? And they've had presidents and people say that more gets done there than anywhere else. That's all we're saying is that of course there's powerful Jewish lobbies and, and defense lobbies, and we're not debating that. It's okay. just that. All I ever hear out of people is Jew, 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 and then and then they make stuff about me and claim that Jews are running what I do, and it, it's just crazy. I think Jews run what you do. I'd like to take some calls, but you know if you're just going to run over me, I don't need to be here. I'd love to take some calls from the callers. Well, David, but we're just... not running over. You've talked as much as we have. No, Rob, no, but... Rob got to talk maybe three minutes total. You well, got maybe... to talk an hour. He respond to what, what the Jewish individual said here. He said, well, but he's intermingling and everything in Israel. Why is it, if, 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 if it's truly not a matter of the supremacy of the Jews and the international globalists, then why is it that, there's the question, an open question, why is it that Israel is the only country on earth right now that allows segregated settlements, that Israel's the only country that can ban marriage between a Jew and a non-Jew by the basis of... Yeah, of I think that's wrong, and that's yeah. why you've gotten calls of, of apartheid and stuff. And a lot why, of it is Israel uh, is has... Israel it, with the, the Palestinians and yeah, get away with... It. Hey, David Duke, you've been yeah. given... Let's just be clear today here, for the record. You've okay. talked more than I've talked. You've talked more than everybody else. You keep implying you're being cut off. You keep implying you're being run over. And it's just not an accurate, uh, truthful statement. You have been given a ton of time here. And well, so let's just judge. stop making those false claims. Well, the audience will judge anyway, but I'll just take some calls. I mean, oh, I know. Like, I know all your buddies will bitch and whine that well, you, that, 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 because normally everybody falls down and worships you. But the point I, is, is that you did. The, the fact is, you got to talk more than I did. Well, that's it for our show tonight.